Watch, let me turn to Amir. Uh, picking up on this question of the state being absent, another finding in the report is that traditional authority is respected more than uh, modern political authority. You've occupied positions in both worlds. Um, how do you see um, traditional authority and the state working together? Are there things that the state are doing now that could help or that are undermining um, the additional reach that traditional authority could have in reaching uh, young people and you know, populations that are marginalized? Yeah, thank you, Jenda. Now, traditional leaders uh, like me um, find themselves in a very difficult position. On the one hand, uh, politicians are very happy for you to go and fight fires, okay? Uh, tell people to keep the peace, uh, preach to people, um, condemn violence. On the other, you're not allowed to criticize root causes that may come from the failings of politicians. So it's fine to say um, to a rural villager, you should send your daughter to school. But it's not fine to say to the governor, why haven't you built a school? Okay, it's fine to um, talk about um, the extreme uh, nature of, say, certain interpretations of Islam, but it's not fine to talk about how certain people have been marginalized uh, by the creation of a rentier state that basically expropriates resources and does not care about them. Um, if you take Nigeria, in 1960, land per rural uh, dweller was two hectares per rural dweller. Today we've got 0 0.9. Agricultural policy uh, still remains far behind. Productivity is much lower than the rest of the world. You don't have food security. You've got millions of children out of school. It's not the fault of the children that they're out of school. Somebody was supposed to build those schools. Um, so uh, the difficulty for traditional institutions is, on the one hand, they're firefighters, and I will continue to do that. On the other, um, to actually address the root causes of extremism, you've got to address questions of governance education, um, health care, corruption. And to do that is now political. And, and, and so that, that, that's the uh, difficulty, I think. If you take the UNDP OHDI poverty index in 2015, um, poverty levels in Nigeria, 46%. And 46% doesn't look too bad compared to other countries. <coughs> However, if you break these numbers down, in the southwest of Nigeria, 80% are living above the poverty line. In the Northwest, 80% are living below the poverty line. And suddenly, it becomes two different countries. Okay, you, and now, and even those numbers don't tell you anything. As governor of Central Bank, I looked at numbers that said people are living on less than $2 a day. And it sounds bad. But you don't really know how bad it is until you look into the eyes of a woman whose baby has just died because she cannot afford drugs worth $5 then you know what living on less than $2 a day means. You look at demographic numbers and demographic explosion, and you don't understand where they're coming from until you come to a society where a poor man who earns nothing has decided to marry four wives and have 25 children, and you cannot take care of them. And, and you, you see a complete failure of social policy. I mean, who is talking about marriage? Who's talking about family structure? Who's talking about child spacing? Who's talking about the ability to maintain the children that you bring? And when we go into crowd resources as states, so you have state governors in the north who have three million, five million children on the streets without school. They go to China and they're looking for money not to build schools, but to build a light rail. <laughs> You know, I mean, you spend $2 billion on a light rail. $2 billion. Imagine how many children you would educate with that. You know, 